Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Phys Ed Summit 2020. This session is Health in Action. I am Alicia Blanchett. I teach at DC Everest Senior High in Western Wisconsin, that's central Wisconsin. And um, I'm here to take you through a session that's hopefully going to help you take classroom content to classroom experiences and skill practice. So welcome, thanks for being here, and let's go ahead and get you started on our journey for today. All right, here we are, health in action. What I'd like to do is um, kind of what I've already told you, we want to turn some content into some skill practice. Uh, what that allows us to do is some really great teaching strategies. So we're going to implement developmentally appropriate and challenging learning experiences for our students. We are going to work on engaging our students in critical thinking and creativity through doing rather than just sitting and getting, which we know they don't like to do. And honestly, a lot of us don't like to teach that way as well. So we're gonna try to use some tangible learning strategies to help develop their understanding as well. Well, why? They probably don't need to convince you on why we should do this, but let's go for it anyway. First off, for their development, um, I teach older kids, I teach teenagers, um, and so making sure that everything that they're doing is developmentally appropriate is super important because it helps them with the connection to the learning. Um, but first off, one of the first things that I have them do when they start class with me is figure out what sort of learning style they have. I want to know who I'm teaching. I want to know as much as I possibly can about them. I also want to know who my auditory, visual, and tactile learners are. And the more that I teach health, the more that I have my students do this, um, what I actually have them do is take a quick 20 question quiz on what their learning style is. Uh, the more I find that the majority of my students are actually tactile learners. I would say that I have about 60% in each class where their major learning style is tactile learning. So these are the kids who need to be able to do something with their hands, some sort of movement with their body in order to make a better connection to the material. Um, speaking of development and the fact that they're teenagers, I also know that teenagers are in the limbic system part of their brain development. Why is this important? This is important because the limbic system is the emotional control center of the brain. We all know that teenagers have heightened awareness, heightened emotions, heightened hormones going on, um, which can be a little hard to deal with at times, but at the same time, if we know this about them, we can also use that to make a better connection with their learning. So anything that you can do to give them an experience or to help them create emotion is going to help them better connect to the learning. We want them to have skill practice. Health has made some incredible moves towards um, moving away from memorizing, um, reading textbooks, uh, not that reading is bad, but a lot of sit and get learning, a lot of just quick rote memorization for learning. Uh, we've made some really great strides in moving towards skill practice. Well, why do we want to do that? Well, because health is all around us. We are, we're doing health every single day, um, lots of different parts of the day. So we want them to have the skill practice so then they can use it in whatever they need it for. We also want to create some variety in learning. Um, Attention span is a big deal as far as how fun is it for you to sit and do the same thing for 45 minutes. We have to think about that with our students as well. We want to make sure that we're mixing things up for them. So turning something into a more tactile experience is going to help them change it up a little bit. It's going to help with their attention span. So how are we going to do this? Well, what we want to try to do is take some content information and we want to try to create an experience so we can introduce what the idea is, but then we want them to actually experience, well, what does this look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Um, and go on from there. So we want to try to make, um, specifically, we want to try to take something intangible and make it tangible. And there are lots of really cool things that we're doing in health right now, um, especially when it comes down to uh, like mental emotional learning. I'm seeing a lot of a lot of focus on that right now with the coronavirus going on 
um, there's a lot of stress strategies. There's a lot of mindful movement. Uh, there are, goodness, adult, adult coloring books, uh, breathing, all of that good stuff. Uh, and what I've noticed with my own students is that they're really good with all of this talking about this and practicing these things. They're getting really good at identifying coping strategies for stress. Um, so they're really good on that. But one thing that I have noticed that they are still struggling with internal factors of mental emotional health. That stuff is not so good. They are still struggling with that. And I recently did my mental emotional health assessment with my students. And one thing that kept coming back from them was self-image, self-image, self-image. And so they're still struggling some, with some of those internal things. And so not only do I want to make tangible learning experiences, but I also want to take what they're learning that's intangible, that they're thinking about, the self-image, the self-talk, um, all those things that are going on inside of their head, their mindset. And I want to try to create tangible experiences in those as well, because it's really hard if you're a tactile learner and you're trying to think about what these things look like, it's really hard to um, kind of get a feel for it, get an idea, or even the concept of practicing if you can't manipulate it in some sort of tangible movement. So we want to try to give these kids that sort of experience as well, knowing that eventually, of course, it does need to go back to intangible. But think about if you could manipulate a thought or if you could manipulate a feeling, um, how much more sense that would make to you, especially if you're a tangible learner. So that's what we are going to start with today. And here's kind of a look at the agenda that I've got going for us. So we want to look at some of those internal factors, starting with the cognitive behavior triangle. But we're going to look at thoughts, emotions, a combination of those. And then we'll also do some external factors of stress too. But what I really want to do is give you an idea on how to take that intangible idea and create an experience through it. So speaking of which, we're actually going to start with the cognitive behavior triangle going to explain that to you, but I wanted to start there before moving into thoughts and emotions to explain well, why is it that I'm talking about thoughts and emotions with my kids and um, kind of setting up the process of what that looks like. A couple of things that go into that before cognitive behavior triangle is we talk about growth and fixed mindset with my students. Um, just the idea that looking at you know, you don't have to be perfect at something right away. There's a whole, there's a learning process. There are the stages of learning, but you just have to be, but you have to be open to being able to learn and you have to be open to the idea of that there's a possibility of failing as well. I also take a look at the locus of control with my students, an internal locus of control versus an external locus of control internal meaning that you feel like you have some sort of control over your life over situations that happen to you versus an external locus of control where you just kind of feel like everything happens to you um, rather than having some sort of control over it but we're going to go ahead and start with the cognitive behavior triangle a fairly widely accepted psychological theory is the cognitive behavior triangle this triangle indicates that a lot of our mental emotional health comes from the way that this triangle works. So within the triangle, we start with thoughts and thoughts create feelings. Feelings then influence our actions and our actions reinforce our thoughts and continue to keep us going around and around in a circle unless we can break the cycle. Now, the good thing about this is if we can recognize it, we can teach our students that these actions and feelings come from somewhere. And if we can direct them back to our thoughts, we can teach them how to have some, of the, some control over their feelings which cause their actions. And we can either stop them in this cycle or we can teach them how to reverse it or go back to the point that caused whatever angst um, that they had been feeling. Okay, so taking a look at the cognitive behavior triangle, we know that thoughts create feelings. So one of the first things that you want to do is you want to give your students some sort of tangible experience on purposeful experience on um, thoughts, on practicing thoughts. So one of the activities, the first activity that you can try is just a simple word game to kind of get your students warmed up. 
And so this word game is played with one other person. And all you have to do is intro with a word. And then the first person intros with a word. And then the se second person thinks of the first word that comes to mind based off of what the first person said. So I have my son Brendan here with me to show you how this game works. And I'll give you guys some time to try out this game as well. So Brendan is here and we're going to play this little word game. Okay. So Brendan, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Dog. Cat. Uh, lucky. Zoe. Black. White. Whiteboard. Marker. Purple. Red. Badgers. Football. Um, Packers. Vikings. Ew. <laughs> My word is ew. Vomit. I think we're done so you can see how this goes. Well, thank you. When you play this game with your students, uh, just make sure, sometimes I've seen students play this and they kind of create a linear thought process. So one might say red and the other says yellow. And then the first person says cherries and the other one says banana. So then you can see they're kind of following their own linear thought process. So you might want to talk to them about that ahead of time and make sure that they're working off of each other's word rather than what their last word was in their head. So let's go ahead and give you guys some practice time to try this. You can try it in the chat, um, or you can grab a partner from um, someone you have at home to try this out. The second activity that I have for you to practice intentional thoughts are these mental fitness cards. Now I actually found these when I was proctoring a test with my creative writing teacher and I was just kind of glancing around his room. So I would highly recommend checking out your creative writing teacher's room because they always have lots of cool things that really dig into the senses. But what these are are question cards that deal with all of the sentences, all of the senses. And so on the back of each card is just a question that asks you about something. Um, now this one has to do with all the senses, but within the pack of cards, they also have taste cards, touch question cards, smell, sight, and hearing. And now what you can do with these is you can have a, a set of partners for students um, or you can have a group of three, four, five, however many students you want in this group. And you can give them a packet of these cards and just have them go around the circle and answer the questions to these cards. 
you could have them each pick a card and answer the questions to that or you can have them all answer the question to the same card. And the cool thing about this is not only are they practicing intentional thoughts and digging into their senses, which we also know as mindfulness, but they're also working on their communication skills, their face-to-face, -face, um, answering these questions in a face-to-face -face manner with other students in their age group, which they're not always used to doing as they're so dug into their screens. And so, I have my son Brennan here for you again to show you how we're going to do this. So he's going to come over and he's going to pick a card and we're going to see what's on the back of the card. Want to read it? Some foods have an unmistakably strong taste. Can you name three? So he picked a taste card. You can go ahead. Mustard, grape juice, and... The blueberries that, the small blueberries that are usually purple, the pretty sour. You don't like those sour ones? No. Okay, so uh, my three, let's start with liver. If you've ever tried liver, it has a very distinct taste that I'm not particularly fond of. Um, I feel like onions have a really strong taste, make your eyes water. And let's see, pickles. Pickles. Sometimes you make your eyes water too, but I kind of like that one. Okay, so uh, I'm actually going to give you a card and give you some time to practice this activity. And again, you can do this in the chat function or you can pick some family members at home. So uh, the card question I'm going to give you, or the question card I'm going to give you is on touch. And I'll, I'll post this too. I'll read it too, but then I'll post it as well. So which do you enjoy more, the heat of summer or the cold of winter? Can you think of activities you do only in summer or in winter?
Now that we've done a couple of activities on the thought side of the cognitive behavior triangle, we've done a couple of activities on thoughts with intention, we're going to switch over to the emotion side of the cognitive behavior triangle. And I take this kind of slow because people can be really uncomfortable with emotions and with expressing them, and especially in a class of 30 of their peers. So the way that I start this off is with this book, My Many Colored Days by Dr. Seuss. This book, um, um, it defines different emotions by colors. I'll read it to you in a second, but it just kind of gives them a first way to express their emotions in a safe way, in a not so safe environment, kind of a risky environment. So I'll read that for you in just a second. This is My Many Colored Days by Dr. Seuss. Some days are yellow, some are blue. On different days, I'm different too. You'd be surprised how many ways I change on different colored days. On bright red days, how good it feels to be a horse and kick my heels. On other days, I'm other things. On bright blue days, I flap my wings. Some days, of course, feel sort of brown. Then I feel slow and low, low down. Then comes a yellow day, and wee, I am a busy, buzzy bee. Gray day, everything is gray. I watch, but nothing moves today. Then all of a sudden, I'm a circus seal. On my orange days, that's how I feel. Green days, deep, deep in the sea, cool and quiet fish, that's me. On purple days, I'm sad, I groan, I drag my tail, I walk alone. But when my days are happy pink, it's great to jump and just not think. Then come my black days, mad and loud. I howl, I growl at every cloud. Then comes a mixed up day, and wham, I don't know who or what I am. But it all turns out all right, you see, and I go back to being me. So I actually read this book out in class, just like I did for you, um, which might seem goofy to some teachers, but for me, it's pretty normal, and my kids are used to me doing different sort of things. Uh, they also, they kind of get a kick out of it. It's like story time when they were back in kindergarten, so it's kind of fun. Um, afterwards, we reflect. Well, what was the story about? What was its purpose, and what are we trying to get out of this? So then that's where they get their experience at going ahead and expressing their emotions through color. So our students all have iPads, so what they can do is they can pull up the notes app, and they can turn it into a whiteboard. And so I say, so tell me what color you are today. And it's okay if they use the colors from the story. It's also okay if they don't use the colors from the story. So if they wanna come up with their own colors and their own definitions for what those colors mean, that works too. For our students who forget their iPads or if your students don't have iPads, um, we also have whiteboard. I have whiteboards available in my classroom I got these at the dollar store, so I have whiteboards, I have whiteboard markers. But again, I asked them to take some time and go ahead and show me what color they are so they can express their emotions through color. There are lots of things that you can do with this. Um, the first time you try it, you might just have them express the color. You might just have them do, pat like they can do patterns, they can do the same colors as in the story, they don't have to, they can color code their own things. Um, the next time that you try this, you can have them, you, at the beginning of class, you can say, okay, tell me what color you are today or show me what color you are or write it down or whatever. And then you can have them pair up with somebody and tell them why they're that color for the day. You might wanna take that a little bit slow because again, we wanna make this a safe way to express emotions and kids might not be comfortable right away expressing those emotions with someone else. So you could let them partner up with someone of their choice. You could have them get up and move and find somebody else. Um, the other thing that I like about 
expressing through the whiteboard or on their whiteboard is again, they're getting another tactile movement. So they're getting a sensory sort of feeling of using the marker on the whiteboard. So you're giving them another hands-on experience. Once you get your students situated in this activity and trying this activity, you can then use it throughout the rest of the semester just as a check-in point with them. So at the beginning of the class, you can have them come in and say, all right, get out your whiteboards or grab a whiteboard or whatever and show me what color are you today, what color you are today. So that way you can check in with them and you can see where are they in their day? How's everything going? And you don't have to make a big deal out of it. You don't have to have them tell you every single time what they're feeling, why they're feeling that. That way but that also gives you an opportunity to see where they're at in those kids who are maybe the brown or the purple or the black you want to make sure that you check in with them throughout that class period just to see how everything's going if there's anything that you can do for them all right I'm gonna go ahead and give you some time to try this so I'd like to know what color are you right now so if you could grab a piece of paper and some markers or a whiteboard or your phone or whatever um, you don't have to remember the colors that were in this story. You can use your own colors, but go ahead and give it a try. The next activity I have to share with you is for emotions as well. Now this is a little bit different because I didn't want this activity to be about expressing emotions. What I wanted it to be about was uh, dealing with emotions, manipulating emotions. So I thought really hard about this and was like, well, what is something that's tangible that's like emotions? And I got really stuck on elastic bands. And so I was trying to think about how I could do some sort of activity or trick that had to do with elastic bands, which would kind of emulate the idea of emotions moving, manipulating, snapping sometimes, um, different kind of things like that. And so what I came up with was actually having students practice with elastic bands, and I wanted them to manipulate the elastic bands. And I remembered from way long ago, Cat's Cradle. And some of you, a lot of you have probably played Catch Cradle. Some of you maybe have not played Catch Cradle, but I can tell you one thing, not a lot of our students have played Catch Cradle. This is something that was kind of a new exposure to them. And so I tried this activity for the first time and it kind of developed from there. So this is gonna be an interactive activity. Um, so if you have some sort of string or longer elastic band, you can join in with us. What I use, is this is elastic. This is like a metallic elastic string that I got at Michael's. Um, I keep a whole roll of this because sometimes I have them make reminders of the cognitive behavior triangle. Like I'll have them make a zip cord of thoughts, feelings, actions, or I'll have them make bracelets, something like that. So I keep a roll of this on hand. And so what you can do with that is you can cut off a long piece and bring it to the ends and you can tie it together. So you have one big elastic loop. And I would suggest trimming off these little ends right here because they kind of get in the way of Cat's Cradle. So once you have enough string for about half your class because you're going to put this into a partner activity, you are ready to go. And you can do this a few different ways. 
and you can offer to your students um, how they want to learn this as well. But I don't give them a whole lot of instruction ahead of time. I just say that we are going to work on an activity. Um, this activity is going to help us practice manipulating emotions. And while we're doing this activity, I want you to think about how elastic bands are like emotions. I want you to think about manipulating them. I want you to think about the transfer from person to person. I want you to think about if you're not careful with them, what happens when they snap. You can give them a whole bunch of ideas to think about while they're trying this activity. The second part of this activity is kind of a bonus because most of your students are going to be learning this for the first time. So not only are they working to manipulate emotions, they're gonna to start to feel some of the emotions while they're learning something for the first time. And the idea of the stretchy band makes learning the game just a little bit harder, which might increase their emotional output just a little bit more as well. The other thing that you can do with this is you can offer them some options. You can offer to teach yourself in person with the kids. You can give them an option of a QR code and they can learn from a website. Or if you do have some students in class who know how to do this, you can have them take their own group off to the side and work with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to call my son over here in just a moment. And then I'm also gonna play a video that you can um, work with this at the same time so you're not just trying to see us because you can see it's kind of hard to see. So I'm going to start your video and call him over so we'll be off to the side practicing this while you guys are working on the video. So if you can quick grab your string, get it ready to go, and join us whenever you're ready. Today we're going to show you how to do Cat's Cradle. This is a two-person string game that you play with a friend and basically you are going to create three shapes over and over again and pass the string back and forth to each other. The object of this game is to see how long you can keep it going without messing it up. Okay, to get started, you're gonna take your string loop and lay it on your friend's hands, and then you're gonna pull it up from the inside and wrap it around the wrist once, and then do the same thing on the other side. Now your friend can open up her hands and she's gonna use her middle finger and pick up the string on the opposite wrist for each side. This shape is actually the cat's cradle. This is the first shape. All right, now, you are going to take your thumb and your pointer finger and you're gonna grab an X on each side and you're gonna move it out and around this bottom string. All right, so your friend's hands are this way, so you wanna come at it from the side. You're gonna reach in and grab this X on each side, just like that. You're gonna pull that out around the bottom string and under it, right through it. Now, as you pull, push up, your friend is going to release all the strings and you are gonna open your thumb and forefinger. You should have the second shape, which is this X shape. Next, your friend is going to grab the two X's on the sides and bring them out and around that, the two inner strings and under. Push them up through the center and open her thumb and forefinger while you release all the strings. This makes the tractor shape. All right, so the next step from this tractor shape, you're gonna come from the sides, and you're gonna take your right hand, you're gonna reach over the strings, first two strings on the right, and you're gonna grab this inner string with your pinky finger. You're gonna hold on to that. You're gonna pull it back, make a triangle here. Then you're gonna do the same thing with your left hand. You're gonna reach over the left side and grab that inner right string, pull it back, make another triangle. 
Now you're gonna take your thumb and your forefinger, you're gonna put them into the triangle and under, up, and around the center. Now while you do this, be sure you do not let go of these pinky strings down here. You're gonna open your thumb and forefinger while your friend releases everything. Just don't let go of those pinkies. Now you're back to the cat's cradle again. It may look upside down, but it's the same shape. From here, you just keep repeating all the steps and you try to keep it going as long as you can. Grab the X's, pull them out and around and up through the center. Grab the X's, out and around, up through the center. Up to the center. And you keep this going as long as you can. See if you can not mess it up. And it's sometimes fun to see if you can speed it up a little bit too. Okay, so if you like this game, be sure to check out some of my other videos on string. Okay, so there's how to play. Um, and then what I'm going to take you to is the reflection that I have the students afterwards. So this is kind of a culminating event. Up until this point, we have talked about mindset as far as growth mindset and fixed mindset. We have talked about locus of control and we have also gone through the cognitive behavior triangle. So at this point we're looking at well how were you with all of these things? They didn't necessarily know. They knew that they were manipulating emotions but they didn't necessarily know that they were going to learn something new today. So their reflection is to go through the cognitive behavior triangle first. So what were your thoughts as you were completing this process? What feelings did that create inside of you, especially when the elastic wasn't doing what you wanted it to do? And then how did those feelings influence your actions of how you proceeded with learning the game or for your kids who are teaching the game with the frustration that was maybe occurred when they were trying to teach the game as well? And then we come down to reflect on, well, where was your mindset? How did you approach this activity? Learning something new as you get older can be really hard to do because you have this idea of um, how you should be good at things and things that you're maybe not so good at or things you're trying for the first time can be really frustrating. Um, the next thing we take a look at, well, what were your thoughts while you were doing this? Were you using an external locus of control or an internal locus of control? Where were you on that spectrum? And then kind of some ideas for next time. So what is one thought you can tell yourself next time you're approaching something new? So you kind of get a little bit of a phrase going inside their head that this is new, this might be hard, I might not get it right away, to kind of do some of that mental emotional prep work ahead of time and get it really stuck in their head. Um, the nice thing is too that if they had some emotions during this game, they'll have that memory of those emotions and if they can get a mantra inside their head that will hopefully connect a little sooner as well. So then I want them to explain how emotions are like elastic bands. And then what are some things that you should remember when transferring your emotions from one person to another? So we're hinting a little bit at relationships here as well as conflict resolution and communication. From there, I ask them to take an emotional intelligence quiz. So they go through their emotional IQ. Purpose of this, see, well, what are the sorts of things that go into emotional IQ? And the really cool thing about the test that I use is also it gives some strategies as far as what can you actually specifically do to improve these things. More often than not, my students, when we talk about emotions or mental emotional health, they always wanna tell me PMA, I'm gonna have a PMA. Well, I find that most of them don't actually know what PMA is or how to do it. So I wanna get as specific as possible with these strategies for them. So I absolutely encourage you to try this game. It's fairly inexpensive and it'll create a really great experience for them. Here is a purposeful positive compilation of the Cognitive Behavior Health Triangle. This is somewhat new, but I put together 
um, a haiku. So the idea is to combine thoughts, feelings, and actions with uh, mindfulness in motion. And you, I have the document attached here for you to try it if you'd like to with your own students. And you can learn more about it on Andy Milne's Slow Chat Health blog that I wrote for the microblog week. So haiku in health and PE, mindfulness in motion. The last activity that I'd like to share with you is an external factor of mental emotional health. A lot of our students understand that they're stressed, but they don't really always understand what's causing their stress or what they can do about it. So I have them play this game on multitasking, or the goal is to cause them to multitask and recognize what that feels like. So I actually have them play a memory game where I ask them to play the game of memory while counting backwards from 100. And I put together, I just take 12 cards, I put them in a little baggie, have them play with a partner, and this is what it looks like. From there, we break down what multitasking looks like in our own lives and what sort of cause and effect that has on us. Um, then we do a visual, a much bigger visual than this of what multitasking looks like um, when everything is swirling around. And then we practice some breath exercises to let everything calm down. And we do some external stress strategies like coloring, like games, um, just some kind of fun stuff. We do a progressive relaxation. The last thing we do is we make these little um, multitasking reminders, stress strategy reminders. And so these are just these little jars right here that I got on Amazon that the kids can fill with colored glitter and I have some little animal beads in here and whatnot. And then they fill them up with distilled water. You can get those at any store. You can do a couple of squirts of glycerin and or you could do corn syrup. Um, throw some glitter in there, put the lid back on, and you've created your own tiny little mind in a jar. And so then the students can keep these. When they're feeling stressed, they can shake them up, they can practice some breathing, and watch as the glitter floats down to the ground. So I hope that I was able to give you some good stuff. 
that um, you can take and you can use in your own classes at some point. Here is my resources page. I have some of the documents that I use in my own classes or where you can find some of the items that I use as well. So thank you so much for your time. Please feel free to reach out to me with anything that you need or if you'd like to break something down or talk about it or whatever, but thank you so much.